Welcome to week 12. Uh, the slideshows have been uploaded. I was just a little slow in getting them up there. Forgot to do them. Uh, due dates are up on the board. Assignment 2. Drop dead at 11. Well, basically at midnight tonight. Automatic 0. Thank you for those that don't submit. Six assignments or six or eight assignments right now I don't need to grade. You know who you are. Lab 10 and the hybrids. You have until August 10th. I also have things I need to do before the end of before I hand in all my final grades. That can, that includes grading everybody's stuff. Uh, this gives me enough time because my grades are due by the Tuesday, so 12, 13, 4, my grades are due on the 15th. I will accept no work after the 10th for anything. That's the only time I'm really obtuse about my, but there's a limit. When there's a limit, that's the limit. Okay, so. We are stepping into the third set of concepts that we're teaching for database. And what this is, is the side that's called, it's for programming the database server. So far you guys have learned how to do design work. In other words, you've learned how to lay out your data structures. You've learned how to query your data, how to add data, how to change your tables, that kind of stuff. Technically, that is not programming. Technically, that's called data management. There is the ability to program database servers. And programming database servers is a little strange compared to what you guys have probably gotten used to with Java. And this concept has actually been shortened a bit for you guys, actually in the last couple of terms for 8215, because this used to be a level two course which assumed you completed one whole programming course, and by the time you landed at this, you had almost a second course under you. Um, so this will be covered at a fairly high level. Um, and then I will break it down somewhat more detail. Uh, I won't be doing any demos this week, but I will be doing demos next week. So you know, and I'll make this announcement right off the bat. I'm doing the review next week. My review's a little funny. You go, those are people that see go, well, that's kind of weird. That's the fastest review ever. Can anybody give me a guess why I don't need to do detailed reviews? I record all my lectures. You have a, there's a better review there than I could ever do in class. If you're not sure about a topic, you know roughly when we took it. Go back and look at it. You'll have it in more detail. Uh, but I do cover the topics that are going to be in the exam and roughly how things are, you know, done. So that's the last announcement. So this week I'm doing the intro to database programming and I'm going to talk about user-defined functions. Uh, I'm also going to be talking about triggers. Um, okay. When programming the database, there's three options. There's functions, which you guys should know what those are by now, right? They're like methods in your classes. So picture this as a method of your database that you create yourself. Um, there's stored procedures, which depending on the database server, it's roughly the same thing as a function. And then there's triggers. See, I didn't make my announcement this week. <laughs> and then there's triggers. Triggers are the shit. When it comes to talk about database programming, triggers is where all the magic happens. Um, I'm a big fan of triggers. I'm a big believer in using them. Um, once you might roughly understand what they do, you might actually see why. Um, now, what's really cool about Postgres specifically is that most database servers give you one language to work with. MySQL has something called runtime. It looks like basic. For those of you that know what basic looks like, it looks like basic. Sort of looks like Fortran. It's basically the, um, how can I word this without being politically incorrect? It's the kid that eats paste of the database programming languages. It does everything you need it to do, but it's like three times harder than it needs to be. Oracle has one called um, PLSQL. Great. It does everything you ever wanted a database language to do. 
Uh, Microsoft SQL Server has something called Transact SQL, and they also let you write your triggers in C Sharp, which is kind of cool. Um, Postgres, on the other hand, offers, and I've got four languages listed here, they actually offer 26 different languages. They've got a programming language for any given job. Uh, but these are the top four, one of which is now pretty much dead as a doorknob. Uh, PLPG SQL is the standby. That's the standard one. It does everything you probably need it to do. Uh, it is about 85 to 90% compatible with Oracle's, which is why it's very popular. Uh, there's PL Tickle. PL Tickle's dead as a doorknob, but it's still installed by default. There's PL Perl and Perl Guy Left, so, you know, he doesn't get to hear that one. Uh, and there's also PL Python. For those of you that know how to program in Python, you could choose to use Python. Now, for all my examples, I'll be using PLPG SQL, and I'll describe some of the core parts you get in that language. It's a single purpose programming language. It is a self-contained language. Now, do you guys know the difference between a single purpose language versus a multi-purpose language? No, they didn't teach you guys that yet, if at all? Okay, a multi-purpose language is a language you can write programs to do all kinds of jobs in, such as Java. You can write games, you can write applications, you can write websites with it, depending on what kind of server you've got going. There's all kinds of things. A single purpose language is a language whose job is to do one thing, but do it well. For example, there's a language called R. I don't know if anybody here ever hear of R? Anybody here ever study statistics? Okay. God damn, no examples. R is a language designed specifically for statistics. That's all it does. It's optimized for doing stats. It does stats really, really well, and that's pretty much all it can do. You feed some data into it, and out comes more data. That's its purpose in life. You can't write games. You can't write interfaces. You can't do anything with it but stats. That's a single-purpose language. PLPGSQL is a single-purpose language. It does one job well. It manages data. It talks to your database server. It's fairly simple. Doesn't mean it's not complex, it's just it's easy to work with. Now there's a few quirks you have to be aware of. Assignment of values has a special operator, colon equals. Colon equals. Can anybody take a guess why the Postgres guys decided to use colon equals as the assignment operator? I want to take a guess. No one. Because what? No. Because the equal sign is the equality operator. Therefore, the colon just saying, you know, set this equal to that. That's what they're using. Um, there's one other quirk about PLPGSQL. Anybody here ever seen Pascal? The language Pascal? You know how you have to declare all the variables at the top? Do you remember how you assign variables in Pascal? colon equal. So it's very similar to Pascal. Uh, instructions are semicolon terminated. That's something you guys should all have ingrained in your brains by now anyways. Conditionals. These are happy if then else bits. It doesn't use curlies. It has if condition then else if then else and then end if. And if ends it instead of curlies like you use in Java. There's for loops, there's while loops, and on that slide there's a link to the documentation for the language. I could spend an entire term teaching this language. But by now you guys should know what a loop is. You should know how to use a loop. I hope you know how to use a loop by now because Howard will be seeing you again next term if you don't know what a loop is by now. Um, so, now there's functions and store procedures. In Postgres, they're the same thing. So Postgres makes no distinctions between a function and a store procedure. However, on there I've got the three points that list off the differences normally. A function returns a value, a procedure does not. It's just like when you create a function in your code, unless you make it a void function, it always returns something, right? 
whether it returns a boolean or an array or a string or a number, a function usually returns something. A stored procedure does not. Storage procedure runs, and then there's nothing else. It just exits, and you hope everything happened. Uh, a procedure is a set of commands. Well, technically, so are functions, but a stored procedure is a set of commands uh, that actually are designed to munge the contents of the database. So maybe you have a function that clears the log files on a uh, store procedure clears log files once a week. Uh, you could have another one that vacuums the database, um, which is you know Postgres specific stuff. But you could have a store procedure that vacuums, does maintenance every week, uh, dropping any temp tables that were created through the week, that kind of stuff. You use them for maintenance purposes, or to convert data, or to um, one of the popular uses for it is to. Remember last week, I think it was, I, or two weeks ago, when I talked about materialized views, where you have a regular view that's dynamic, or you've got the materialized one where basically the data is static and it doesn't change, but it's fast, but the data doesn't change? You can use a stored procedure to repopulate that table. So once a week, it cleans up the table and rebuilds it. Functions should not alter the structure of the database, on the other hand. In other words, if you have a function, it should work on the data you've provided and return something back. So that's just a difference in purpose. In Postgres, you can create a function that actually creates a table, modifies the data you had, inserts it into the table, does something else, and then gives you a value back. Should you do that? Probably not. Because it gets really complicated. And um, I don't know if, did you guys learn about using breakpoints and stuff in your Java class? Okay. okay imagine programming with no breakpoints. You can't examine your variables. You can't stop your code. You can't pause your code and go, what's happening here? So when you're creating code, not saying you can't do it, it's just not easy to make it happen. It's not like, you know, breakpoint run and see what happens. Um, so what happens is you want to keep your code small, simple, and compact. So you can test each piece individually, and then you assemble it into a, a functional whole. First thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about defining a function. And when you define a function, you basically create the function, you either give it its name, define the arguments with any data types and defaults if applicable. You define the red type. I have an example on the next slide. slide. Uh, you define the variable in the code. You do a return value in the end of the code. Does that sound familiar? It basically sounds like defining a Java function in Java, right? You In Java, you'd go whatever it is, public space, function, space, whatever it's called, bracket, arguments, close bracket, curly, magic code inside, close curly, end of function, right? It's the same. The language is different. The concept is the same. Um, however, the syntax is different. All right. Create or replace function. Or replace is optional. That just means your function already exists. It's the same thing as in doing if you did a drop function, then you create the fun recreate the function. Uh, you tend to use that a lot during um, development time. So you go create function. Give it a name. Who cares what you call it? Really, names are arbitrary. You should try to stick to lowercase. Obviously, there's no spaces allowed. It's actually going to blow up if you give it spaces at the name. So in this case, I call it function random number. We'll open up the brackets, sides, integer, number of dice, integer. This is the dice roll code. It returns an integer. And, and then as. So you remember a bit how we did the other stuff where you did create view, blah, 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 as this. So we're going to create a function called random number with two arguments, and it's going to return an integer. Now, the special thing, though, is the dollar signs. See those two dollar signs? That's a code delimiter. PLPGSQL is what they call a block level language, where you can actually define multiple blocks of code, and they actually live separately from each other. So imagine if you had a single Java file where you could have the code for three different programs inside that one file, and it would build three different executables. You can do that with this, sort of. 
Um, have I ever done it? No. Because you can doesn't mean you should. It's just there. Um, the double dollar sign, or actually the way it works is dollar sign something dollar signs. You can just abbreviate to double dollar sign, or you can go dollar sign some tag dollar sign, so then you have to match it to the bottom. And what that does, it tells it, when you look at everything inside between these two items, ignore the semicolons. So that because what's the command terminator? Semicolon. So what happens when you run a command in your database that has a semicolon? It runs everything up to that point, right? You type in select star from this where block semicolon. And then you type in another select statement. It runs the first one, then it runs the second one. What happens is if you have semicolons inside your code, which obviously there's a bunch, it would reach to this point and say, hey, my code is complete because the semicolon is here. So the double dollar signs tell it, ignore every, all the semicolons in here. Otherwise, you know, bad things are going to happen. And I can guarantee for everybody here, that's going to be the first mistake you make. It's almost a given. Don't feel bad when it happens because 90% of people uh, make that mistake. Now, I'm declaring a variable, declare total int. So I'm creating a variable. I'm declaring it. In other words, declaring the, it's an, in, an integer, and it's called total. And actually, my slide ate my code. Please hold for a second. I'd rather have this look proper. There we go. That's a little better. Declare the variable. Then there's something called begin and end. Picture the begin and end being essentially your curlies in Java. You can have multiple begin and end blocks. So you can tell it do everything inside this block as one unit, and you could wrap everything in an if statement if you want. So you could alternately run different blocks of code if you wanted. The rest of everything inside of it should look fairly familiar to you guys. Uh, total is assigned to zero. Why? Because we should always, you know, initialize our variables properly. And then we go for i in one dot dot number of dice. This is the same thing that you guys are probably used to. That should look sort of familiar. The world's very first example of a for loop. Syntax is different, significantly noticeably different. What throws everybody the most for a loop is this. Actually, I should go over on this screen. This. And that's a really weird syntax. I'll admit it, it's strange. At least if they'd use you know, three dots give us a proper ellipsis, but they didn't use an ellipsis, they used two dots. So it's such thing for i in one till number of dice loop. Then you do total is equal to the total plus, I got a couple of functions thrown in there for fun. So I'm ran, creating a random number plus one and I'm rounding it to, you know, the closest integer up or down. And loop, it once it's done looping, it returns the total, the code block ends, the double or dollar signs reappears to tell it after this. You can start paying attention to the semicolons again. And this is what's a little different for you guys. Language PL PGSQL. You're telling it what language this code is written in. In other words, everything above the double dollar signs is SQL. Everything below the double dollar signs is SQL. Everything in between could be any given language. Could be Perl, could be Python, could be PL PGSQL, could be PHP. Uh, I've seen it in V8. Uh, if you guys don't know what that is, that's JavaScript for Chrome. Apparently, you can use JavaScript to write your functions if you want. You have to add on the extension, but you can do it. You can write it in Parrot, whatever the hell that language is for. R. There's a dozen. There. Oh, and you could even write it in OpenCL. 
Now, some of you may not know what OpenCL is. Those of you that like to do Bitcoin mining know what OpenCL is. It allows you to use an NVIDIA video card to do the math for you. So you can write a function to crack people's passwords by using your video card's accelerator. They've got languages for everything. I don't know why you'd want it, but I don't know, just they offer it. Well, that's what a function looks like. And in this, you've got examples of variable assignment, math, a loop, declaring a variable, the code blocks, and everything else. Like I said, I'm doing the demos next week. I just rather let this stuff percolate for a week. Um, but it should be enough to get you started for the lab, for lab 10. Yes? Uh, because the semicolon is instruction terminator. So what happens is I'm just going to walk over here so you can see what it's pointing at. Create a replace function that integer, integer returns integer as dollar sign, declare total int, oh, we're done now. If we don't have the double dollar signs, it ignores everything else. So it stops here. So this tells it ignores sem the semicolons so that it can treat everything inside the double dollar signs as a continuous block of code. It's important. Otherwise, your code never reaches the end. Uh, can you not put semicolons in Java? Um, now, mind you, if you're working with Python, there are no semicolons. We still need to use the double dollar signs to tell it that there's code here. Because there might be something else in there that's, you know, used. If you're using Perl, semicolons. If you're using Python, you've got tabs. Tabs get kind of funny in, in computer land anyways. Yes? PL Python. PL Python or PL Python 3, depending which version of Python. Or you'd have PL Perl or PL Tickle, PL, PLR if you're doing stats. Um, yeah, that's that, that language just tells it what kind of language it is. Uh, there's a few other flavors of languages also. There's PL Python U and PL Perl U, which are untrusted languages which means they're allowed to actually go leave, the, you're allowed to write code that leaves the database server and actually manipulates the system outside the server. So let's say you got a website that has files, but the files are stored on the disk. You could theoretically get it to go and say, oh, I deleted this file out of the database, now let's go nuke the file off the disk and the database takes care of it for you. So you don't need to trust the programmers. Let's never trust the programmers. Um, but yeah, they have untrusted. That, that's actually uh, very rare that servers allow you to do that. So I don't tend to bring it up too much. That's just two extra languages for fun. Yes? Well, it's the proper way to lay it out. The loop, the word loop can be down there. So you could do four number in this, and then you could have the word loop here. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's, that's the start of the loop, and then end loop ends the loop. Sure, that's just the syntax. It's for whatever condition, loop, end loop. Or you could do while true loop. And then loop. That's just how it's laid out. That's just how it works. It's just like the syntax of English is not the same as the syntax of insert language here. Romanian, for example. Or Bulgarian. See, I do pay attention when people talk. Okay. Now to triggers. Now that we talked about functions, and really, there's no, you guys have learned about functions in Java. That's why I don't spend a lot of time on it. It's syntax. And that's the only way you guys are going to learn the syntax is to type it in. And there's tons of syntax examples online. So Stack Overflow is your friend. Okay, triggers. <sighs> triggers. Now, you guys haven't learned about event-driven programming yet. And I don't know if they actually teach it to you guys anymore. Because the world's going doing this slightly weird thing where they're going back to the way things were done in the 60s. Which is kind of funny. But when I was coming, when I was going through school, this brand new language had just come out. 
It was absolutely fabulous to work with. And when I say it, many people are going to giggle. Visual Basic. Right? I just aged myself a lot. But in 95, Visual Basic 2, which is what was just come out, was revolutionary. It allowed something called event-driven programming. You could use a UI to draw a form, put some buttons, and then you could double-click on the button and then write some code. And that code would respond to events. Everyday you use your computers, your phones, whatever other gadgets you use, it responds to certain events, right? Mouse click, you know, drag, drop, keyboard entry. Those are all events. So that's event-driven programming. And what that usually means is, unlike, for example, the game you guys are writing now, where the computer prompts you for information, so you're responding to the computer, event-driven programming is the other way around. The computer is responding to something you did. Whether or not it was expecting it, it's going to respond to it. And triggers are events. They deal with events, when things happen. That's why it's known as a event-driven environment. And it allows um, six moments in time. Now, for those of you that have actually ever looked at a, an event-driven language, for example, if you look at a mouse, there's mouse down, mouse up. Double click, double right click, mouse middle click, shift click, you know, there's all these different events. But there's usually, you know, two sets of events, mouse down, mouse up, key down, key up. With the computer, uh, with databases, I mean, there's six moments in time total that you can capture um, that normally you would be able to capture. There's before and or after an event. So those are two timing. And then the events are insert, update, and delete. So these are uh, DML commands where you're modifying the data. So you can write a piece of code that happens before an insert. So somebody goes, types an insert into database, blah, 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 semicolon, enter, and you define a before event. It's actually going to capture what you just submitted to the server, execute some code before it actually applies it to the database. After happens, after it's successfully written the data, I've actually got a little flow chart uh, two slides down. Uh, after it's happened, then it moves on. There are global or per row level triggers. Um, there's actually, I talk more about that in a bit. Um, and depending on the database server, uh, the trigger may or may not be part of a transaction. If you're working with a real database server, such as Oracle, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, your triggers are contained as part of the transaction. MySQL is not. Uh, MySQL allows data to be modified even though the trigger fails, which is bad. Okay, now I've got a chart. I'll be putting it up, but there's a few things you should know about uh, before I show, that, so show the chart. There are two data structures, and I'm actually going to be writing on the board in just a moment. Uh, they're called new and old. There's actually a lot more than those two. Um, and actually, in one of the further slides, I've got a link to all the different special variables that get created. Um, but the two important ones are new and old. The new contains the data that's being pushed to the database server. It's available during the insert and the update. The old data is what was there before. And that's available if there's an update and a delete. Now, can somebody take a guess why? So, I'm going to finish the writing this and I'll ask the question. So that's the pattern of the new and the old. And can somebody guess why 
For example, for the insert, there is no old data. Hey? It's an insert. It's an obvious question, but you'd be surprised how some people don't understand the concept of you're adding data to the database, so there's nothing there before, so there's nothing for, for the database to put in old. It's impossible to put something in old if there's nothing there before. It's like saying, I'm building a house. Give me the old house when you build this house. Well, there's no house there. Update has the new and the old. So what that means is when the trigger fires off and it says you're updating row number 55, before anything else happened, it reaches into the database server, grabs a copy of row 55 and puts it in old. And the data you're pushing into row 55 is now contained in new. That means you can see the old data and the new data. And why would you want to be able to see the old data and the new data? Not necessarily, but at least you can compare. You can say, well, did this field change? If this field changed, then we need to do something. If this field doesn't change, therefore we don't need to do anything. We can create our code so it's conditional. Delete. Doesn't have new, but it has old. Somebody want to take a guess why you don't have new? You're not, you're not putting anything in, right? So if you're not putting anything in, therefore there's nothing new. But before you go and you delete, it's going to grab a copy of the old one so you can look at it and go, maybe I want to make a copy of this somewhere so you can log it for auditing purposes. Or maybe you want to grab a copy of it and update records elsewhere. For example, with MySQL, depending on how you define your database, you don't have proper referential integrity, which means you don't have cascading deletes, which I never really taught to you guys, but there's no cascading deletes. That means that after you delete a parent record, there's orphans. And everybody hates orphans. At least they hate them in their database. Orphan kitties are okay. But the orphan database records are hell. Why? Because they're a nightmare to deal with. You'll have data coming up that looks wrong. Why is it wrong? Because there's an orphan running around mucking up the place. With MySQL, we'd actually have to write triggers after parents successfully deleted, go delete the children. So it's like having Agent 13 walk into a room and wipe everybody out. You know, he might not like doing the job, but he'll do the job. All right, there's a flow chart. It's going to be terrible on the stage. It's not bad on the screen. It is on the slideshow, so if you suck down the slideshow, you should be able to look at it. This is the flow of the code during a transaction. So when you guys were doing an insert and an update, all these decisions were being made. Literally, you would go through this entire flowchart every single time. Now it's a computer. It's going, decision made. However, SQL command is received. The next step, it says, is this a command that's actually writing to the database? Is this a DML command, update, insert, or delete? No. Okay, well, I'm just going to run the command. There you go. Done. Now it says, oh, but we are going to manipulate the data. So then it checks to make sure that the query is good, as in, is the command valid? Yes or no? If it's not, it tells you you suck and ends. If the command is good, it goes and does the following thing. Is there a before trigger, yes or no? If there isn't, skip. If there is a before trigger, it executes the trigger, it makes sure it ran properly. If it didn't run, it bombs out. If it ran properly, it goes to the next step, which is it executes the actual command in the database. If that worked, if it doesn't work, it goes to the red box. So far you've seen this pattern of going to the red box. If it worked, it says, oh, we were able to update the record. Is there something we should be doing now after that's happened? So here's the after event. And then it processes the after trigger if needed. And then if all that worked, everybody's happy. It returns the results of the command and exits. It's an awful lot of decisions to be made. Now I'm going to add one more column. to my diagram. I just need another color marker. What are the odds I reach in here and I pull out the exact same two colors I have out? There we go.
Actually, I'm gonna go. Before and after. There's something special that happens in before and after to your data. And in this case, we can actually ignore old. And I'll explain to you why we can ignore old. Because whatever was there before is irrelevant. After you're done the command, it's discarded. However, with the new data, I just wrote that the new data is read-writable after the data is read-only. Before it's read-writable, afterwards it's read-only. Now, what I'm going to do in a second is, I shoot, I forgot a piece of paper. Somebody got a, just a piece of paper I can borrow? Well, it's not going to be a borrow. It's, it's going to be toast when I'm done. Thank you. Okay. So, one of the purposes of the before triggers is to manipulate the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be the SQL, um, I'll be the database server in the sense that um, I am going to accept the command, parse the command. I'm going to make Eli and, God hope it's Allison, Allison before and after triggers. Okay? This is my data that I just brought in. So I'm going to write a bit of information on here because I'm, I'm, so the new data, I'm going to put in Dan. However, there's nothing else. But let's say there's a field called created with a timestamp. Then what's going to happen is Eli's my before trigger. He's going to manipulate this, right? Take this, take my marker, write today's date. Before trigger, he's modifying my data, right? I haven't applied it to the database server yet. It's just a piece of data that's floating out in the ether so far. Okay. Now I'm the database server. I'm going, oh, good, I've got data. Now I'm going to write it over here. Okay. Modify the data that's on the board. You can't, because you happened after I committed the data to the board. I, I love using this example. It took me years to come up with the perfect physical example of how this works. People have a really hard time understanding the fact that you can change anything in the new data before it gets written. Once it's committed to the database server, all the after trigger can do is post-processing. Oh, I need to add some information to another table. Auditing purposes, logging you know, that kind of stuff. Before, read-write. After, read-only. Mind you, the old data could be read-write also, but considering the old data is about to get discarded, you know, there's not a lot of use to modifying the old data before it gets written. It's kind of pointless. There's always somebody who could come out. I could have another teacher walk in here and give me a perfect example right now of why you'd want to do it, but, you know. There's always an example. Okay. Good. I'm almost, I'm almost done my slideshow. Okay. Postgres specific. Now, there's a whole bunch of text on this slide. Um, PostgreSQL has both regular triggers and event level triggers. The event level triggers, I just found out Postgres had, like literally, you know, yesterday. I was actually reviewing some of the functionality in Postgres and somewhere in the last couple of versions that came out, somewhere between 9.2 and 9.6, they threw an event level. Regular triggers are attached to a single table and they capture only DML events. Insert, update, or delete. So update user, log the fact that they changed their password. Connect the trigger on the customer. Change every, uh, modify the last modify date every single time the record gets written. That kind of stuff. 
Event triggers are global to a particular database and they can capture DDL events. Uh, I'm not going to get to a lot of detail because I've never actually played with them because I'd never had the option to play with them before. Um, but essentially, you can actually capture the fact that a create table command has been run and actually modify it. So let's say somebody does create table and adds three fields. You could actually write code to add two more columns to it. Why? I don't know, but you could. Um, in Postgres, triggers are a two-part thing. There's a function, and the function must return a trigger type. So you know my example earlier returned an int, an integer? It must return a trigger. If you don't return a trigger, it's not going to work. The, tri the function can be anything. You could do anything you want in there. But it must return a type called trigger. Um, and two slides I've got an, from now, I've got an example. Part two is the actual trigger that calls the function. So the, the, you know, basically, you've got a function. What the happens is it calls, uh, the trigger calls the function. So it's a bit, there's an event. The event happens as use this function to do stuff. Um, Postgres is kind of cool. Um, in the sense that it allows for code reuse. I'm like with MySQL, you create a trigger, and let's say you have a trigger that updates the created timestamp or the last modified timestamp of, of a record. And you have this last modified timestamp on every table in your database. That means you gotta write a trigger, a before insert, before update trigger for every single table. And you actually have to write out the entirety of the code for every single one of those. With Postgres, you can create a single function called update timestamps and then attach it to each of the ones. So if you need to fix your code, you modify the function in one place and everybody gets it. Code reuse, it's a fantastic thing. Um, which is why Postgres is a little different. Oracle is similar. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server is not like this. MySQL is not like this. Uh, IBM DB2-ish, kind of. It does a bit of both. You can do it as a function or as a, a standalone unit. Um, I guess I could have skipped that point. There's lots of languages to pick from. Um, there are special variables, and the link is on this slide to get you to them. Uh, there's one called pgop, which tells you if this was an insert, an update, or a delete. So you could write a single function and say, if it's an insert, do this. If it's a delete, do that. Um, so you can log and just write one function that does it all. That's kind of cool. Okay, that's the syntax for the create trigger. That's an abridged version of what's on the Postgres site. Um, I'll, I got an actual functional example. Um, and there's the link right here for the, the complete syntax. But it basically, you go tr create trigger, give it a name, and you have to tell it the timing before, after, and Postgres has something cool called instead of. <coughs> so you say if you create an instead of trigger, it means that instead of actually doing the insert, do this instead. Ignore the fact that we're doing an insert. Because sometimes you don't want to let people insert data unless they're allowed to. So, or maybe you don't want them inserting into a certain table because they don't actually have the ability to insert into that table you actually want it to do three different inserts. You want to take the data they submit and actually break it down into three different places. Some of the functionality that allows. The event can be an insert and update. Theoretically, you can be specific and say only fire off when you update a specific column. I've had strange results using that technique. Um, it's kind of cool, but it's a little weird. Be careful if you ever try to do it. Um, delete and truncate. So they can capture the fact that a truncate happened. So you could write a trigger. For example, sequences. You guys have learned the concept of the big, the, big, uh, the big serials, where it counts and counts and counts. And even if you emptied out the entire table, that number stays the same. You could do an after truncate event and reset the counter back to 1 if you wanted. So you could reset back to 1. Um, you have the option for each row or for each statement. When I do the, the demos next week, I'll explain the difference better. Um, but let's say you're doing an update statement and it affects multiple rows. 
That means you want this trigger to run for every row that's being updated. That's for each row. Or if you do for each statement, those are known as a global trigger, as in fire this off, regardless of how many rows are affected. You want So this would be an after trigger, for example, where the guy modified 26 rows. You could write a function that says do deleted 26 rows. So instead of logging each row with a change, you could say, you know, Dan accessed the database and deleted 26 rows. That's a glo that's a you know a global level trigger. Um, and then when is if you actually want to add extra rules, nobody uses it. It's rare. Uh, but I threw it for in there for fun. And then you execute the procedure. So here's the trigger function. Should look fairly familiar. It's the same declaration style as the one I just did before. Except in this one, I decided to throw in a word inside between the dollar signs. Dollar sign body, dollar sign. It's just to show that that tag can be anything as long as there's two dollar signs involved. Dollar sign something dollar sign, or it could just be double dollar signs. I'm doing an if statement. If the new dongle serial is not equal to the old dongle serial, then I set the new, you know, just like I got Eli to write on the piece of paper the date. It's firing off a, an insert into the log. Remember when you guys were doing that little uh, lab where you had a table with a bunch of serial number changes? That's the trigger that would have made that stuff happen. Um, there is a few things in here that's a little different. There's a command in here called current query. That's Postgres specific. It allows you to actually capture the command that modified the data. So you want to know what command just fired off to actually trigger the command, the trigger. So you fired off an update statement. And you want to know what that if state statement was so you can find it in code. Um, it inserts into a log table. And if, here's the, the important one though, right here, return new. Because I'm returning a trigger I'm returning new. So the new is the new data being returned. So basically, this is an, it's a trigger data. You could return old and discard all the changes. So you could theoretically say you're not allowed to change this if this serial number changes. Um, but return new. And whatever, it's PLPGSQL. This function that's on the screen uh, is actually in production in our database where I work right now. Uh, that's the one. I, that's a function I had to write seven, eight years ago, and it's still going today uh, because of the jackass in the Netherlands that insists on trying to hack us. Uh, so we banned the Netherlands. Um, can't trust the Dutch. My boss is Dutch, and he says you can't trust the Dutch. <laughs> it's funny when he says it because you know he's Dutch. <laughs> but. Uh, no, actually, we've unbanned them now, but you know we had to ban them for about a year while we figured out how to close the holes in our system. Um, but I literally wrote this exact trigger, and right now that that this this particular log table um, right here, dongle serial log, is sitting at uh, a million rows a day, roughly. I have every serial number changed in the last seven years for every single product we've ever sold. And it's, and it works. So this is, there's your if statement. Um, I'm using the old and the new. You can see how I'm modifying some of the data in the new. And then I'm applying it. Now, this function actually had a little bit more code in it uh, after the if statement where I was setting some timestamps also. Well, then I discovered that was pretty much pointless because I was logging the data anyways. And here's the trigger definition itself. Create trigger on this before update. Now, normally you do this as an after update. But because this actually modified some of the other data as and created certain timestamp, the last modified time and stuff, which actually you'll see it right here. Dongle serial last changed. Um, what's happening is I'm keeping track in the actual dongle record when that serial number changed last. Therefore, if I'm going to modify the data, when am I allowed to modify the data, Allison? 
Yes, before. I'm picking on you today. Before. Therefore, before I updated my timestamp. Therefore, it has to be a before update because after update, I can't modify the timestamp. So it's create trigger. I call the dongle activity timestamp. Before update on dongles for each row, I'm saying for every row that's being updated, it executes the function. Done. At that point, you hit run on that. The trigger is now attached. And data just magically happens. Hands off. Is there, no, is there a cost? Yes. With everything in a database server, there's a cost. The more triggers you have, the more expensive it gets. Um, Postgres figures out what trigger to run two different ways. The first way is stupid, but it's how it's been done traditionally. It runs them alphabetically. Trigger, and of course you're not allowed to start the trigger name with a number, so A runs before B, runs before C. Historically, that's how you, if you wanted to attach multiple before triggers, you'd name them A underscore, B underscore, C underscore or A1, A2, whatever. Uh, now they've got something called priority. So you can set a priority level, so 100, 200, whatever, and it'll run all the 100s before it runs the 200, so it'll sort numerically first and then alphabetically. So if you've got three triggers that are 100, then it does the alphabetical trigger match. Uh, you can also say run this trigger after that trigger. So you can hard code the order, but that has a risk. Anybody want to take a guess what that risk would be? No, it doesn't make a difference when. Run trigger ABC after trigger DEF. What happens if trigger ABC gets deleted? Trigger DEF will never run. In actual fact, you'll probably get errors because it's going to try to resolve a relationship between the triggers without there. Now, you know in your Java code where you write code, and if you call a method that doesn't exist anywhere in your classes, you get a compile error. Now imagine the database server where you write your code, and you're telling it, go do something with something that doesn't exist. It's going to say, I'm, I love your code. Please let me run it anytime. And then it starts running and goes, ABC, you there. Snap. Not there. Broken. Now I shit the bed. But up till then, it assumed that you did what you're supposed to do and that it was going to be, the stuff was going to be there. The database server trusts you. It trusts you to do the right thing. Unfortunately, you know, most developers, myself included, suck. And we're terrible and we don't always do all the things we're supposed to do.